Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you today for the opportunity, the privilege to come to worship you. Lord, may our focus and our attention always be upon you, particularly in this hour that you've given us. There's no greater thing that we could do than to allow you to be master of our lives and to worship you, for indeed you are worthy. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn to Colossians chapter number 4 as we're going to consider the thought this morning, four proofs of a Christ-centered church. Four proofs of a Christ-centered church in Colossians chapter number 1. If you were to study through the book of Acts, around chapter number 19, you would find... Uh, uh, Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Paul was there, the Bible says, for about two years. So effective was the ministry of the team that God had assembled that the Bible says in Acts that all that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. In other words, there was no place in the whole region that the ministry of Paul and his associates did not reach for the glory of God and through the power of God. Amen. It was at some point during this time that Paul sent his fellow laborer, Epaphras, to spread the gospel in the Lycus Valley, which was about a hundred miles west of Ephesus and there in the valley of Lycus there stood three major cities Laodicea, Heropolis and of course Colossae. As a result of his ministry in Colossae Epaphras was able to found a church there, establish a church to whom Paul would later write this epistle while he was in prison in Rome about the year A.D. 61. Now, I love the book of Colossians. It provides one of the Bibles, I believe, uh, fullest expressions of the deity and the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, he is worthy of our worship again this morning. We ought to say amen. I believe that Colossians is one of Paul's richest Letters, and so let's read together this morning. I'll read quickly so you listen quickly. <laughs> Verse number one of Colossians, chapter number one, says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the spirit and all God's people said amen while in prison obviously Epaphras brings news to Paul from the church in Colossae the news that greatly blessed Paul Paul it ministered to him during a time of hardship most certainly Epaphras words excited his soul. It brought joy to his heart and so should it be this morning. Christians, we ought to tell everyone, we ought to tell others about the good things that are happening in our life and we ought to tell folks about the good things that are happening in the church and the life of the church because I believe that our testimony could serve to inspire others, uh, to intrigue others and we just always ought to be bragging about what 
Jesus has done for us and about God's power in the midst of his church. Amen. Today we're going to look very quickly at four things. If I can preach quickly, y'all know I can't preach quickly. Amen. Today we will look at four things in this passage which cause Paul to rejoice over the believers at Colossae. A strong faith, a sincere love, a sure hope, and a show of fruitfulness. First of all, we learn that these folks had a strong faith in their Savior. Notice with me, verse number two very directly says that Paul is writing, and this is how he addresses the letter to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ Jesus. To the saints and faithful faithful brethren in Christ Jesus. And Paul offers his customary greeting in verse number one. It's obvious God commissioned Paul's apostleship at the time of his conversion and that Paul had no doubt about God's will for him. Church, we need to always strive to know God's will for our life. We should never doubt God's will for our life and we should faithfully commit ourselves to pursue the plan that God has for us. Amen. Because Paul never visited the church in Colossae, his introduction of himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ makes his authority clear. One thing we need to know about Paul, his relationship with Christ always served as the foundation of his message. His relationship with Christ always served as a foundation for his message each and every time he took a pen and he wrote as directed by the Holy Spirit. You could tell that he was grounded in Christ Jesus. Folks around us need to notice our relationship with Christ Jesus. We we should never be ashamed of our stand for Christ. We should never be ashamed of the, uh, of the calling we have to serve Christ. We should never be ashamed to show the world that Christ has made a difference in our life. You will also notice in verse number one that Timothy is visiting Paul while Paul is in prison. There is a great importance in edification that is edifying one another, that is uplifting one another, that is encouraging one another, that is building one another up. Good times, bad times. A friend will be a friend indeed. A friend will be with you on good days as well as bad days. I think about Paul's relationships that we find throughout the book of Acts. Uh, Barnabas, many of you know the story of Barnabas. After Paul was saved, gloriously changed, he one day made his way up to Jerusalem to meet with Peter and the other apostles and as I've told you before on Sunday night, they kind of shunned him. They didn't know what to think about Paul. They was a little unsure about Paul because they knew how Paul had persecuted the church, but it was Barnabas who stood up and said, the way that you see Paul is not the way that Paul is today. The way that Paul used to be is not who Paul is today. What he was now, he's not then, and such is a testimony of every born again, blood bought believer who hopes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We have been changed. We don't dwell in the past and we look to the future and God's people say, Amen. I can remember Silas who was on missionary trip with, with Paul and how that Silas was the one uh, along with Paul who was thrown in prison at another time and how they sang and rejoiced and glorified God even while they were in bondage and I want you to know again your friends will be with you through thick and thin and you mark those who are willing to go with you that extra mile regardless of what others may think and regardless of the cost uh, that might be involved in having you as a friend. Amen. I think about Luke. 
And the great physician who not only recorded the gospel of Luke, but also penned uh, the account of the book of Acts and how his relationship with Paul is revealed and how that, that, that because Luke was a physician, how that he went with Paul and was allowed to go with Paul and to care for Paul's infirmity, whatever that was, bad eyesight, uh, who knows. Uh, but listen, they were all there and how important it is bounty hope for us to know that we can rely on one another to pray for us provide for us and stand with us amen paul addresses them as saints and faithful brethren in christ now he often refers to saints in his writing those who are redeemed However, it's only here and in his introduction to Ephesians that he calls his readers faithful. Among the greatest testimonies that you can have, that we can have, abounding hope is that we are faithful. We are faithful. These believers were genuine. And Paul knew that because of the testimony of Theopolis. And those around the Colossian church knew they were faithful. They knew they were genuine. Their works spoke of their faith. Speaking of faith, Charles Spurgeon once said, A little faith will bring your soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to your soul. So that you can sing and rejoice when you're in prison. So that you can sing and rejoice uh, during the bad times and the good times. These Colossians understood faith. And therefore in verse number 2, they enjoyed grace and peace from God. Grace and peace. Say that with me. Grace and peace appreciated most by those who are faithfully pursuing God's will. You see, those outside of God's plan don't realize the power of grace and peace. Grace is used a variety of ways in the New Testament. Oftentimes it speaks of unmerited kindness that Christ showed on Calvary, willing to die for us so that we did not deserve its grace. Sometimes it's used in a sense which speaks of standing in God's favor. We can't earn God's favor. Sometimes it's used of a blessing bestowed upon one by God and most certainly each and every one of us could testify of how we've been blessed by God. Here the word is used, it literally means stored up help to be dispensed in times of need. Fortunately, I had a little bit, not a lot, I had a little bit of money set aside for a rainy day. And it, it, in my life, it rained. And, and, and we were able to take a little bit of that savings and, and travel out to see uh, uh, dear friends and so forth. And, and, and we were able to put up and have something in reserve. And, 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 and a lot of uh, folks desire is to have a little bit of a financial consideration put up in reserve so that should, should, should some kind of need come up they can tap into that and, and, and sort of and, and sort of get by y'all know what I'm talking about say amen <laughs> but my supply is very 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 limited as yours probably is too but God's supply is vastly immensely uh, uh, unmeasurably great in that he, he has grace to bestow upon us unmerited favor, love, and he has an abundance of grace so that when we feel insufficient, God's grace is sufficient for us. Peace is also used a variety of ways in the New Testament. It's the opposite of war. It's harmony with others. Why can't we just all get along? Well, we can't all get along with the world because it's a matter of values. It's a matter of vision. 
And there's going to be discrepancies between lost and saved throughout the days of time. Hopefully we don't have too many uh, discretionary differences between believers. Say amen. <coughs> Peace talks about health and welfare. Peace talks about salvation. Peace with God. So that Paul would write another place. We are no longer enemies of God. But we are friends. Yea, we are children of God. And here peace. Speaking of that tranquility of mind. It frees us from anxiety and fear. And so when Paul writes these Colossians, he reminds them of the grace, how God has favored them, and how that grace working in their life is obvious to others, and how that peace that they possess is obvious to others. Hey, listen, there's going to be days of anxiety, there's going to be days of fear, but thank God there is peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The second thing, well, first of all, these folks had a strong faith in their Savior. You must be born again, was Jesus' proclamation to Nicodemus. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart the gospel of Jesus Christ, put your faith there, and you shall be saved. But if your faith and your trust has not been placed in Jesus Christ, you are lost, you are indifferent towards God, and you will die, and you will go to hell. These folks had a strong faith in their Savior, and these folks shared a sincere love for all believers. Notice verse number four. He speaks of the love which you have, which they have, which we ought to have to all the saints. You see, the evidence of a person's faith in Christ Jesus is their love to all saints. Let me say that again. The evidence of a person's faith in Christ Jesus is their love First of all, to all the saints, those born-again believers, those of like faith, those who have been grafted into the tree of life, those of us who are called Christians, we ought to show love to our church family, other believers. We ought not forsake them, but we ought to include them, make them an everyday part of our life and, and involve them in our activities. I mean, what a great reputation for abounding hope to have. And that is that we are a church that shows genuine love. Amen? Love. John tells us in John chapter 13, verse number 35, that love is basically a badge of discipleship. This, Jesus says to his disciples, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. A sermon in itself, the sacrificial love that Christ has. Love one another as I have loved you, that you also Love one another. By this all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. If you can't show love to fellow believers, how can you show love to those whose faith is not in Christ? Huh? If you can't love your friends and love your family, how can you love your enemies? How can you love the world? Well, Love for all saints really should begin with those closest to us. An active love in our homes where a husband shows his, life, his wife how much he loves her. His wife shows vice versa. When we show children the love, genuine love that we have for them and children show genuine love and that Grandparents, we have, so, we have so many types of homes, but every home that is Christ-centered knows that Christ is the center of the home. Amen. Amen. Yeah, praise God. He is worthy. Love. 
It's a many splendor thing. Love has a way of ending strife, doesn't it? Huh? I mean, have you ever been in a silly little argument? Y'all are mighty quiet today. My goodness. Love has a way of ending strife. You ever have a sharp word with somebody in your house and you realize, hmm, wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> you ever been on the other end of a sharp word and you say, man, I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> And then you just realize, you know, I love them. And in spite of what they said, I know they didn't really mean it. Or maybe they did. But I'm going to forgive them because love fosters forgiveness. Amen. I mean, it's no wonder uh, 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 Paul uh, uh, Phaphorus mentions the love that the church had not only for Christ but for one another. And love has a way of ending strife. Love has a way of building fellowship. It's no wonder that Paul was refreshed by this loving church. I, your pastor, am constantly, continually refreshed by the love this church exhibits so much so that if the day ever comes when I can't pastor, I want to sit right with you because this is a place where I know there's love. Amen? Amen. Third of all, these folks were sure of their hope of heaven. Notice verse number five. Paul mentions the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Hope, in this instance, is speaking of the hope of salvation. Hope is salvation. Salvation is hope. Hope comes through Jesus. Hope comes through the word of truth that Paul mentions, the gospel, the message of the gospel, which is true. There we have hope. So we don't have to be miserable. Heaven was a reality for these faithful believers. They knew the world was not their home. They hoped for, they longed for heaven and thoughts of heaven motivated them to be faithful. How many of you get to the point every now and then where you just want to get, throw in the towel? Be honest. Man, we'll give up. We'll give up, we'll give up. I don't care. The people at church don't love me. The people at work don't love me. I'm miserable. I got a toenail and a toothache. It hurts on both ends. This is a bad day. You just want to throw in his towel. You see, listen. Uh, listen. Thoughts of heaven seem to have a way of turning our dispensation or disposition into delight. Amen. Where's your focus? Where's your heart? Where's your mind? Sometimes it's so hard to motivate people. What motivates you? Motivates you. You notice in verse number five, uh, they were laying up treasures in heavens, what they were doing. A great motivation for Christian service is our hope of heaven despite all the hardships and the hatred in the world. Conclusion, amen. Let me ask you this. How are others affected by your faith and your hope and your love? Do you have a way of refreshing folks or discouraging other believers? What changes can you make, can I make, can we make in our lives to be more like the church in Colossae? Huh? Proofs of a Christ centered church strong faith in their Savior sincere love for all believers sure hope of heaven imagine I shared this illustration with Westwood Baptist Church last Sunday imagine if you were if you will walking along the beach somewhere on a nice sunny sunshiny day look outside it's going to take a figment of imagination but join with me if you will walking along with the 
sand in your toes and, and you might have to close your eyes and suddenly the waves just come brushing over your your feet and suddenly you bump something with your toe and you reach down and you pick up this beautiful lamp and it's covered with seaweed and it looks a little tarnished but you just take your sleeve and you start rubbing it and you start polishing it up a little bit and poof out comes the genie and the genie says I'm here to grant you three wishes. What would you wish for? What would you wish for? Well, somebody would say, wealth. I want to be the richest person in the world. Second of all, they'd probably wish for health. I want to live long enough to spend all my money. And then with their selfish nature, they'd probably wish for three more wishes, amen? <laughs> the greatest things a person can possess, Paul speaks of in this passage. Faith, hope, and love. But these don't come from a genie in a lamp. They come from Almighty God in heaven. Another great attribute of this church, the first church of Colossae, is found in verse number 6. They were fruitful. They bringeth forth fruit. These folks showed a fruit-filled, spirit-filled life. I'm reminded of Psalms chapter number 1. Speaks of the one who delights in the Lord. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit and he enjoys the prosperity of God. Four proofs of a Christ-centered church, a Christ-centered life, strong faith in our Savior, a sincere love for our brethren, a sure hope of heaven and a show of fruitfulness and faithfulness to the things of God. I want that to be me. I want that to be you. I want that to be the testimony of abounding hope Baptist church. Don't you? Don't you? Paul, an apostle of Christ by the will of God. Know what it is. Know God's will. Try to understand God's plan. And remember that whatever state you may find yourself in this morning, God has a purpose for you. God's got a purpose for you. And when you seek to fulfill God's plan, then you'll know the prosperity. You'll know fruitfulness. Faithfulness is rewarding. It all starts with a simple faith and trust that's placed in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and then letting Christ have control of your life. This morning, I may ask you once again, faith, how strong is your faith? Is it a growing faith? Where do you got your hope? Is your hope in something that's going to pass away? Or is your hope in heaven? What about your love? How often do you show the love of God? I don't know what your need is this morning, but whatever it is, God is faithful to provide for you. As the altar call is given. Rejoice in Jesus. Give Him thanks. Maybe this morning you just need to come and worship. Just worship. Just offer a prayer of thanksgiving. You will notice verse number 3. Paul says we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praying always for you. When's the last time you just come and said, thank you, Lord, for this church. Thank you, Lord, for my church and family. 
Thank you, Lord, for those that you place me among that together we may face the challenges of life. Whatever your need today, God is able. God is able. Heavenly Father, we come to you again in Jesus' name to give you thanks. For indeed, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and you're faithful to walk with us. And so at this moment in time, may we be obedient to whatever it is that your Spirit would have us to do. I pray, Lord Jesus, our thoughts, our focus would be on you during this time of invitation. May we be obedient. As you search our hearts, as you speak to us, may we do that which you're asking of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand again.